Welcome and thank you for joining today's conference, IDIS for Home ARP Tenant-Based Rental Assistance Activities. Before we begin, please ensure you have opened the WebEx chat panel by using the associated icon on the bottom right corner of your screen. Please note that all audio connections are muted for the duration of the conference. You may submit written questions throughout the presentation and these will be addressed during the Q&A at the end. To submit a written question, select all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel, enter your question in the message box provided, and send. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. And with that, I will now turn the conference over to Danielle Frazier, Director, Financial and Information Services Division, OAHP. Please go ahead. Thank you for that. everyone and good afternoon. Welcome to the webinar in this series of About to Use IS and uh, RP. My name is Bill Frazier and I'm the director of the Information Our HUD office administers the Home Housing Trust Fund and Home AR. Hi, Danielle. This is the event producer. Pardon the interruption. Danielle, hi. Your audio is cutting in and out a little bit. Um, okay. All right. Yeah. Is it is it possible for you to dial in? Um, oh, it's still cutting I, out a little bit. I, I, okay. Or if you have a headset, that may also work. Send me the number, and I don't have a headset. Working. Yes, here. I will. All right. One training. second. Let me let me check your number. We, you just move ahead with the training without me. It's totally. It's. I can. Yeah. Um, the intro too. And if Teresa just wants to. Send you a second. Start. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to repeat a little bit of what uh, Danielle said. Hopefully, my audio is coming in okay. Um, you sound great. Good afternoon. It's okay. All right. Thanks, man. Yes, sounds good. So, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the second webinar in our series of webinars about using HUD's integrated disbursement and information system, known as IDIS, for the Home American Rescue Plan Program, or Home ARP. My name is Jessica Sumanjaya. I'm a senior affordable housing specialist at the Office of Affordable Housing Programs, the HUD office that administers the Home Program, the Housing Trust Fund, and the Home ARP Program. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar about using IDIS for Home ARP Tenant-Based Rental Assistance Activities, also known as TBRA. I'm joined today by two of my colleagues at the Office of Affordable Housing Programs, um, Teresa Palacio and Courtney Christensen, as well as Danielle Frazier. Um, during today's webinar, we will be showing you how to use IDIS for the home ARP TBRA type activity type. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please feel free to enter them into the chat. We will not be answering questions directly in the chat. However, we will be monitoring the chat throughout the webinar, and we'll leave time at the end of the presentation to answer questions related to home ARP TBRA activities in IDIS. We're going to do our best to get to as many of these questions as we can. Because this webinar covers the IDIS functionality for home ARP TBRA activities, if you have specific policy questions related to um, TBRA, or if you have IDIS questions about topics other than TBRA, please contact our team via email. The email address is homearp, H-O-M-E-A-R-P at hud.gov. Or you could also submit a question through the IDIS Ask a Question portal on HUD Exchange. So thanks again, everyone, for attending. So we're going to go ahead and get started. So this slide summarizes our plan for today. We're going to start with some background information on TBRA, and then we'll get into some specifics about TBRA activity setup and funding, as well as activity completion. And then we'll move into a pretty detailed demo that will show you exactly what the TBRA screens and IDIS looks like, and then we'll wrap everything up with some Q&A. Slide, please. So let's get started with a brief overview of TBRA. 
Essentially, TBRA is when a PJ provides an eligible household with assistance for housing and housing-related costs. This is not too different than home TBRA. The main difference, obviously, is that for home ARP, the assistance must go to a household that is one of the specified qualifying populations for home ARP. Additional details on what TBRA is and what the specific eligible costs are can be found in the home ARP notice, which is linked here on this slide. The second thing I want to talk about on this slide is our office's newest fact sheet called IDIS for Home ARP TBRA. Um, this fact sheet was published just this morning and it covers everything we're going to talk about in today's webinar and more. So the fact sheet is linked here on this slide. Um, when you have time, please go in and review it, read it. It's got a ton of super helpful information on the Home ARP TBRA screens in IDIS as well as some useful tips and notes. So please give that a read when you have time. Um, now, we just wanted to include some quick information on qualifying populations or qualifying household. As mentioned before, for home ARP, TBRA must go to a qualifying household. The home ARP QPs are listed on this slide. And for more information on QPs, please refer to the home ARP notice. I know we're moving really quickly and really superficially over the programmatic topics today, but again, this is a systems webinar, so we'll be focusing on system-specific questions and issues for today. If you have any programmatic questions related to TBRA or QPs, our recommendation is that you use the email address I provided earlier, or you contact your CPD rep at the field office. So now it's time to get into the specifics of TBRA activity setup and funding. So when do you set up a TBRA activity in IDIS? This seems to be a bit of a point of confusion for a lot of grantees, so we're going to clarify that today. You set up a TBRA activity in IDIS only after you have executed at least one rental assistance contract to provide TBRA to a qualifying household. This is based on the definition of commitment to a specific local project for TBRA, which is shown here on this slide. And you're going to want to wait until you have this executed contract because when you go to set up the TBRA activity in IDIS, the system will ask you to enter the date your contract was executed on the activity setup screen. If you don't have this date or don't know this date, you can't do much with your TBRA activity, like fund it anyway. So you're going to want to wait. Um, next slide, please. So now we're clear on when to set up your activity. Now, how do you set up your TBRA activity in IDIS? When it comes to TBRA, as a PJ, you're going to have the opportunity to make a couple of decisions that are going to affect how you set up and fund your activity in IDIS. And we've come to one of those decision points now. So when it comes to setting up your TBRA activity, you have two options. And don't think too hard about this. This is like a very low stakes, easy to grasp choice here. So option one, you can set up your activity so that each qualifying household gets their own IDIS activity. We're going to be referring to this option as a single household setup option. Or option two, you can set up your TBRA activity so that multiple qualifying households are grouped together under a single IDIS activity. We're going to refer to that as the batch setup option in this webinar. HUD has no preference on which of these two options you choose. Both of them are equally functional, they're equally acceptable, and each choice will have its own advantages and disadvantages. So, you know, just, you can pick whichever one speaks to you. It doesn't really matter, you just pick. So, now depending on what you chose for your activity setup option, it will determine what you enter as the commitment date for your TBRA activity. Now in IDIS, the commitment date is referred to as the written agreement execution date. And Teresa is going to show you exactly what this field looks like in IDIS and where you can find it during the demo section. But basically, if you chose the single household setup option, then you only have one household in that TBRA activity. So you should enter the date that contract was executed with that particular household as the written agreement execution date. Now, if you chose the batch setup option, you're going to have multiple households included in that single activity. That means you have multiple rental assistance contracts associated with that single activity. So which of those contract dates should you enter as the written agreement execution date? Well, you should enter the date you executed the first contract. So the earliest rental assistance contract, whenever that was executed, that's what you should enter as the written agreement execution date. Okay, so now we've come to our second decision point. 
Remember I said before that you're going to be making a couple of decisions about your TBRA program that are going to affect activity setup and funding. And really, this is a choice you likely would have made at the very beginning, way before activity setup even, because it's the decision about how your TBRA program is going to be administered. So will you as the PJ be administering your TBRA program yourself, or you, will you be having a subrecipient administer your TBRA program on your behalf? If you will be administering the program yourself, if your TBRA program is going to be PJ administered, then you will fund your activity with entitlements or EN funds. When you have a PJ administered TBRA program, you may not set up any subgrants and IDIS to set aside money for this TBRA program. You must fund the activity with EN. If your TBRA program is going to be administered by a subrecipient, so some other entity will be administering the TBRA program on your behalf, then you must fund your activity with SU funds. When you have a subrecipient administered TBRA program, you must, you must subgrant the funds to set aside funds for this TBRA program. You must create an SU subgrant to reflect your subrecipient agreement and then use that SU subgrant to then fund your TBRA activity. Okay, so to recap the last few slides, because those are some tricky concepts we just covered, especially if you're new to TBRA or new to home. So for TBRA, you as a PJ will be making two decisions that will affect your TBRA activity setup and funding. One of those decisions is who will be administering your program. So your TBRA program will either be administered by yourself, PJ administered, or it will be administered by a subrecipient, which is referred to as subrecipient administered. The next decision you will make involves how you plan to set up your activity. So do you wanna go with the single household setup option or the batch setup option? And these two decisions are independent of each other. So you make one choice, then you make another choice for a total of four possible outcomes four possible camps your TBRA activity could fall into. So this slide is really just a cheat sheet of sorts, like to recap what the commitment date, so what the written agreement execution date should be, and what the fund type that you should use should be for to fund your TBRA activity based on which of these four camps your TBRA activity falls into. So hopefully you'll be able to use this as a helpful reference for the future. Next slide, please. Now the remaining items we're gonna be covering during this overview section apply to all TBRA activities. So regardless of who is administering your TBRA activity and no matter what activity setup option you chose. So the first of these kind of universal concepts involves how much you should fund your TBRA activity for. Now this seems to be another common point of confusion for grantees, but you should fund your TBRA activity for the total amount of executed contracts you have at the time you are funding the activity. You don't fund the activity for how much you think you will eventually spend or how much you said you would spend in your ARP allocation plan. You only fund it for the amount of signed leases you have right now. And if you only have one executed contract, that's fine, but you can only fund the activity for the amount specified in that one contract. And just as a note here, some of you who have prior IDIS experience with home TBRA, you might already know this, but we actually updated IDIS in November, 2021 to enforce this requirement. So now for all newer TBRA activities, so anything set up after November, 2021, the funded amount for your TBRA activity is actually capped based on the beneficiary information you have entered into IDIS. And Teresa is gonna go over the specifics of how IDIS calculates this amount and how it will enforce this cap during the demo section. But basically when you set up a TBRA activity, the system will ask you to enter subsidy details for each household you assist. And this is not new. This is always how the TBRA screens worked in IDIS. For every household you assist, you always had to enter into the system any security deposit assistance you were planning to provide, how much of a monthly subsidy you were planning to give, and how long of a lease term this household has signed on for. The only new thing is that now IDIS will use this information to calculate the total subsidy amount allowed for this activity. And this is obviously a constantly changing total. So as you add new households to your TBRA activity, sorry, Teresa, can we go back one? Um, or edit the subsidy information for an existing household, IDIS will automatically be recalculating the allowable subsidy amount and adjusting the funding cap for your TBRA activity as you make changes. So it's a constantly changing total um, that's updated by IDIS as you make changes to the activity setup screen. 
And this should actually make it easier for you because IDIS will display this funding cap, this dollar amount, right on your TBRA activity setup and funding screens. So now the system is doing all the math. Um, next slide, please. So now what about project delivery? Well, when we implemented the funding cap for TBRA activities in IDIS, we also added a new field called project delivery costs. And this new field is located right on the TBRA activity setup screen where all the beneficiaries for the activity are summarized. So any project delivery costs you have for your TBRA activity must be entered in this field. And that's because IDIS will adjust the funding cap for your TBRA activity based on what you have entered in this field. So it's important for you to remember to enter that information, otherwise the funding cap for your TBRA activity will not be accurate. Next slide, please. Now, what if the subsidy amount for a household changes? That's a common question we get from PJs. So what if, for example, a household drops out of the program or moves to a new unit and the amount of TBRA they will be receiving changes? What happens then? Well, because of the new funding caps for TBRA, activities that I just mentioned, it's important for you to go into the household's edit beneficiary screen and update the amount of subsidy they will be receiving so that IDIS can adjust your funding cap for this activity accordingly. And it's really a two-step process, right? So first you adjust the beneficiary information for that household on the activity screen, setup screen. IDIS will then recalculate the funding cap for your activity. And then you have to remember to go into the activity funding screen and then adjust the funded amount for your activity to match this new cap. And yes, I understand that's gonna be kind of annoying, but it's something that you're really gonna to wanna to stay on top of because the implications it will have on what we talk about, um, because of the implications it will have basically on what we're gonna talk about on the next slide, which is activity completion. So when do you complete your TBRA activity? Well, you should complete your activity once there are no more eligible costs to pay for qualifying households in that activity. So it doesn't matter if there's one household in your activity or 100 households. Once you've made the final payment, whether it's for household one or household 100, and there is nothing left to pay, you should complete your TBRA activity. However, you're going to wanna make sure that all the subsidy information on the activity setup screen is accurate and up to date because the system will not allow you to complete your TBRA activity until the funding cap for the activity, and IDIS calls this cap amount the eligible TBRA funding amount. So the eligible TBRA funding amount must equal the actual total funded amount for that activity. Those two numbers have to match in order for you to complete your TBRA activity in IDIS. And Teresa will be showing you the specifics of how this works in the activity completion demo later. So this wraps up the TBRA overview, and I'm going to turn things over now to Teresa to begin the demonstration portion of our webinar. And Teresa, your line is muted, so just go ahead and unmute yourself. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Jessica. So for our first scenario, the city of any town has decided to use some of its home ARP funds to start a TBRA program for its residents. The city has allocated $250,000 of its home ARP allocation plan for the operation of this TBRA program and anticipates assisting 100 qualifying households. Before we move into our demo on how to set up this activity, we're going to do a quick knowledge check. So based on the information from scenario one, can the PJ set up its home ARP activity in IDIS? We're gonna put the poll, put up the poll question and I will share the scenario text again while you're thinking about your answer. All right, and ladies and gentlemen, the poll question will appear to the right side of your WebEx screen as a panel. Simply click on your response, and then on the bottom right corner, press the Submit button to submit your response. And we do have 20 seconds left on the timer. Thank you. 
All right, looks like we do have several audience members that have not submitted their response, so we're going to give them a couple extra seconds before we share the results. All right, let's go ahead and post the results right now. Okay, and the results should appear again on the same polling panel. Great, thank you so much. And yes, most people are correct. The correct answer is D. The PJ cannot set up its TBRA activity yet because it does not have an executed lease agreement. So remember, as Jessica said, there must be an executed lease agreement before the PJ can set up its activity in IDIS. Great job, everyone. So now it's been a few months and any town has identified and executed one lease agreement with one qualifying household. The tenant contract information is listed here in this table. So now that the PJ has, it has an executed lease agreement, it can set up the activity. So we are going to pretend that we are any town and we're going to set up this activity. But before we do that, we have to decide whether we want to do a single household setup or a batch setup. For this example, we're going to do a single household setup. And as a reminder, that means that each qualifying household has its own IDIS activity. So one household, one activity. All right, so let's set this activity up. We've logged into IDIS. And this is the first screen that we see. To set up an activity from here, we select plans, projects, and activities from the top blue ribbon. And then we select add under activity on the left-hand side of the screen. Now we need to select a project to set the activity, to set up the activity under. So we search for a project. First, we're going to select the program year. Before we move to the next step, I want to really emphasize the importance of the program year. All home ARP activities must be set up under program year 2021, and that is specific only to home ARP. So this is important, so I'm going to repeat it one more time. All home ARP activities must be set up under program year 2021. If you set up a home ARP activity under any other year than 2021, there are a lot of different scenarios of what may happen in the system and what you may be required to do to fix it. So to avoid any of that, just remember, all home ARP activities must be set up under program year 2021. Okay, so the next thing we do is select the program that we wanna associate this activity with. And for home ARP, that will always be the home program. So we select home and then we search. The search results will bring up all of our 2021 home projects. For our example, we're going to select this project here. And we know that it was successfully selected because we received this message at the top of the screen. Next, we're going to name our activity. We've chosen Anytown Home ARP TBRA 2021 as our activity name. And we scroll down a little bit and we make sure to select the Home ARP checkbox. This is important because by selecting this box, you're letting IDIS know that you want to see the Home ARP activity types. So make sure you're checking this box. Otherwise, you'll be setting up your activity under the Home program instead of the Home ARP program. So we, um, my, my apologies, we selected that box and we selected TBRA as our activity type. Now we complete the section three information and the environmental review information and we save. When we select save, the page refreshes and then IDIS gives us this message at the top telling us that the new activity has now been saved. To get to our next activity setup screen, we'll scroll down and select add home. And that takes us to the add 
Home ARP setup detail screen. And this is where we will enter our written agreement date. As a reminder, for single household activity setup, the written agreement execution date is the date that the rental assistance contract has been executed for this specific household. So for this example, we'll go back and take a look at our tenant contract information. And we see here that the date of the signed lease agreement was on April 25th, 2022. So we'll add that date here in the written agreement execution date field. The written agreement execution date is very important for a few reasons, but the most important and what we want you to really remember today is that you cannot change this date after the activity has been funded. So please be very careful, double, triple check the rental assistance contract before you enter this date to avoid any complications with the activity later. So now we wanna add beneficiaries. So we'll come down here and select add beneficiary. And this is where we add all of the information about the household that's being assisted. So for the Haverford household, we've entered all the required information here, and then we save. After we save, we receive this message at the top of the screen, and that's telling us that the TBRA beneficiary has been added. The thing that we really need to pay attention to is the, this in this warning message, is that it's telling us the activity funding of $0 is not equal to the amount eligible for TBRA funding based on the beneficiary data entered. The activity cannot be marked as completed. So the first thing I want you to remember about this message is that it's green, which means it's, it's just a warning message. And a warning message in IDIS does not prevent you from entering or saving any information in IDIS. It's just the system giving you a friendly reminder that there are additional steps that you need to take to fund and complete this activity. And we'll talk more about that in just a few minutes. But what I want you to take away from this right here is don't be alarmed by a warning message. It's only a warning and you can keep going. So always remember green means go. So the most important part of that message tells you exactly how much funding is eligible for this activity based on the beneficiary data that we entered for this household. So right now, IDIS is telling us that based on the information we entered down here, the monthly rent and that the tenant contract information, we can only fund this activity for $12,400. So we enter, like Jessica said, we enter in that information on the beneficiary screen and IDIS does the math for us. And it'll give us a very quick summary right here of exactly how much we're allowed to fund the activity for. Below the beneficiary information, there is a field where the PJ can enter the project delivery cost for the activity. For this activity, we're going to say that it will cost $1,500 for project delivery. And then we save. When we save, the system takes us back to the edit activity screen and tells us that our eligible funding amount for this activity has increased to include that $1,500. Lastly, we, oh, my apologies. Lastly, we know that our activity has been successfully set up because now the activity funding button appears at the bottom of the screen here. That button will not appear on this screen unless all of the required activity information has been entered. So if you're looking for this button and it's not appearing or it's grayed out, it's because there's something else you need to complete with your activity. Okay, so we are in Etown and now we've set up our activity. What comes next? Now it's been a few more months and Anytown has identified and executed lease agreements with two additional households. So in addition to Haverford, now we have Dwyer and Jam households. In the single household setup, we will take these two additional households and set up one new activity for each household using the exact same process that we just demonstrated in scenario two. For the sake of time, we aren't going to walk through that process again. We've already set up 
We've already gone in and we've set up the two new activities for these households. And you'll notice that these households now have IDIS activity IDs listed here. And that's because each household was set up as its own activity. So each household will have its own IDIS activity ID. But what if any town had decided to set up one activity with all three households instead of one activity for each household? That would mean using the batch setup option instead of the single household setup option. And as a reminder, like Jessica told us um, just a few minutes ago, the batch setup option means that you're going to group all your households into one IDIS activity. So let's go ahead and walk through how to set up a home ARP TBRA activity using this batch setup option. To set up this activity, we'll follow the exact same steps from scenario one until we reach the add home ARP setup detail screen in IDIS. And that's this slide right here. So you can see that title at the top of the screen here. So you know that that's, that's where we're at. And again, for the sake of time, we aren't going to walk through that exact same process. Instead, we've set up our TBRA activity using all of the steps from scenario one, and now we've reached this screen here. So the first thing we wanna do is enter the written agreement execution date. Now for batch setup, we're adding multiple households to one single activity, but we can only enter one written agreement execution date in the IDIS. So earlier, Jessica explained the differences between the written agreement dates for a single household setup and a batch setup. So thinking back to a few minutes ago and using the information here, what written agreement execution date should the PJ use for this TBRA activity? And again, the polling question has appeared on the right side of your screen. Simply click on your response and then click the submit button to submit it. All right, let's go ahead and share our poll results. Yes. Oh. All right, the poll results do appear again on the right side of your screen on the polling panel. The correct answer is A. The PJ would use February 14th, 2022 as the written agreement execution date for this activity. So remember for batch setup, the written agreement execution date for the activity is the date of the earliest executed lease agreement. And of these three households, February 14th is the earliest date. So we go ahead and we enter that date here and we scroll down a bit and we select add TBRA beneficiary. We're familiar with this screen now. So we enter the new household data and we save. And IDIS gives, this gives us this message again, telling us that based on the beneficiary information we entered, we can fund the activity for $12,400, which we can see listed here as well. And then again, we remember to add our project delivery cost and we save. To add our second household, we'll select add TBRA beneficiary. And again, for the sake of time, we've entered this information already. So you can see that reflected here as well. The eligible funding amount has also been updated again. And we also receive 
the additional warning message about the funding of the activity. Now we'll enter our third beneficiary. Again, for the sake of time, we've already done that. Um, and we can also see that the eligible, eligible funding has been updated again now to $38,250. We will update our project delivery cost. Let's say it's $1,500 per household. So that will be a total of $4,500. And that brings the total eligible funding amount for this activity to $41,250. Now that our activity has been successfully set up, that means we can fund it. So the activity that we just set up is a PJ administered activity. And that means, as Jessica explained to us, that the activity is being carried out by the PJ not another organization. And that matters to us because it affects how we fund the activity. So to fund a PJ administered activity, we use entitlement funds, which is the EN fund type in IDIS. To get started, we will return to the IDIS homepage and select plans, projects, and activities again. Since we know our activity name, we've already entered that and we search. Then we select our activity from the search results here, and we scroll down to the Edit Activity screen, and we select the Activity Funding button. That selection will bring us to the Edit Activity Funding screen. So remember, we just said we need to fund this activity using the EN fund type. So we locate the entitlement funds here and select add edit. We go here and read the activity funding certification. We select agree. And this is where we can fund the activity. So you can see here that the eligible funding amount is to the right of the total funded field, which is a very helpful note because it reminds us of exactly how much we can fund the activity for without having to go back to the previous screens. Right now, this activity has not been funded. To fund it, we'll move down to the funded amount field and enter the total amount we want to fund the activity for. And that amount is always going to be the eligible funding amount, which for us in this example right now is $41,250. IEIS will not allow you to fund the activity for more than that amount. So that's what we entered here. And then we go ahead and save. After we save, IDIS tells us that we've successfully funded the activity at the top here. And now the total funded amount is equal to the eligible funding amount. So now that we've funded the activity, we're going to go ahead and draw funds for the activity. So to do that, we'll return to the IDIS homepage. We'll select Funding Drawdown from the top blue ribbon. And then we'll select Create Voucher on the left-hand side of the screen. And that takes us to the Create Voucher screen. First, we have to enter the activity ID number that we want to fund, which we know here is 2364 and then we search. We can see here that the activity has been funded for that amount, and that is the maximum we can draw for this activity. So we'll enter the amount we wish to draw here. Let's say we want to draw $950. Then we select Confirm Voucher. We read the Drawdown Certification and select Agree. Now this screen can be a little bit confusing. Sometimes people get to this screen and think the voucher creation process is already complete, but it's not. So at the top here, we have a message reminding us that we must select generate voucher to complete the request. So we go ahead and do that. And now we see that the voucher was successfully created. All right, so we've set up our activity 
we've funded it, and we've drawn funds. So what's next for our PJ? Now Anytown has amended existing executed rental assistance contracts with two of its three qualified households. So what should a PJ do if the subsidy for an existing TBRA household changes? First, the PJ needs to enter, needs to edit the subsidy amount for that household, and then the PJ must adjust the funded amount for the activity. So let's go ahead and walk through what that looks like in IDIS. We have returned to our activity and we've navigated to the setup details screen. What we need to update is the length of the tenant contract. And when we do that, IDIS will automatically update the eligible funding amount. Now you can see we've updated the Dwyer household from a 12 month lease agreement to 15 months. And we've updated the JAM household from a 12 month lease agreement to 10 months. And the eligible funding amount has also changed. So we completed our edits on the beneficiary screen. The next update we need to make is to the activity funding. So we'll navigate back to the edit activity funding screen. And we notice right away that the total funded amount here does not equal the eligible funded amount for the activity. So that means we need to increase our funded amount. To do that, we'll go here and select add edit next to the entitlement fund type. And then the funded amount needs to be updated here. So we'll change that from $41,250 to $41,700. And now our total funded amount is equal to the eligible funding amount. And we've successfully completed the required updates to our existing TBRA activity. So now in our next scenario, any town is approached by a local nonprofit called Housing People Everywhere about operating a TBRA program on any town's behalf. So any town executes a written agreement with the nonprofit for $150,000 for the operation of the TBRA program. So what does that mean? And what should the PJ do now? This is another reminder of what Jessica explained to us earlier, a TBRA activity can be administered by the PJ itself, or the TBRA program can be administered by a nonprofit organization on the PJ's behalf. And we call that nonprofit a subrecipient. We're gonna walk through how to set up and fund a subrecipient administered TBRA activity right now. Before we get into the demonstration, it's important to note that the only difference in respect to IDIS between a PJ administered TBRA activity and a subrecipient administered TBRA activity is the way the activity is funded. So PJ administered activities are funded using the EN fund type and subrecipient acti administered activities must be subgranted to the subrecipient, subrecipient, excuse me, and therefore are funded using the SU fund type. So before we can subgrant the funds to the subrecipient, we first need to set up a sub fund. I do want to just make sure to emphasize here that you have to set up a sub fund and a sub grant together. You cannot just go to the sub grant without first setting up the sub fund. So sub fund, sub grant will always go hand in hand. And it can be really easy to forget that. So make sure that when you're starting this process, if you are using a subrecipient, you set up that sub fund first. So let's walk through how to set up a sub fund. To set up a sub fund, we will return to the IDIS homepage and select grant from the top blue ribbon. And then we will select add under sub fund on the left hand side of the screen. We'll enter our search criteria to locate the grant we want to use to create the sub fund. So we select the home program slide, the SU fund type, the 2021 program year, and then we search. We locate the home ARP grant from the search results. And we know it's this top one here 
because it has the blue flag indicator to the right of the grant number. So that's how we know that it's our home ARP grant. So we select add fund type, and then we're taken to the add sub fund screen for our home ARP grant. So right now, there isn't an authorized amount for this sub fund, so we need to add an amount. The amount authorized for the sub fund is the amount from the written agreement that any town executed with a nonprofit housing people everywhere. And that amount is, as we stated earlier, $150,000. So we enter that amount and we save. Now the sub fund has been successfully added. And since we've done that, the next thing that we can do is set up a sub grant. To set up a sub grant, we just move right over to the left hand side of the screen and select add under sub grant. That takes us to the add sub grant screen where we enter the required information about our sub grant. So the first thing we do is select the home program. We select grant year 2021. And when we do that, the select grant drop down will populate the appropriate grant numbers. And we know that this one here is the home ARP grant because it has this star indicator to the right. So we select that grant and then we select the SU fund type. Finally, we select our organization. So here we can either search for an organization that has been entered into IDIS previously, or we can add a new organization. Housing People Everywhere is a new organization that any town has never worked with before. So any town needs to go ahead and add a new organization. To add the organization, first we have to complete its profile. So we enter the organization name and the address, and then we select validate address. Once IDIS validates the address, you'll see a green checkbox to the right of address line one. And then we'll go ahead and enter the remaining required information about the organization here. And then we scroll down and we save. So now housing people everywhere has been added as our subgrant recipient. Next, we need to add the subgrant authorized amount. The subgrant authorized amount cannot be greater than the maximum, which will always be the amount added to the subfund. And we set up our subfund for $150,000. So we'll subgrant $150,000 to this subrecipient and we save. Now our subgrant has been successfully added. Okay, so we have our executed written agreement with the subrecipient and we set up the subgrant for the subrecipient. So what is next? The now um, it's a little bit time later and the subrecipient has begun the administration of the TBRA program on any town's behalf and has executed five rental assistance contracts with five qualifying households. So we, as any town, the PJ, now needs to set up our activity. Setting up a subrecipient administered activity is the exact same process as setting up a PJ administered activity. And as I mentioned before, the only difference is how the activity is funded. So for the sake of time, we will not be walking through the setup of a subrecipient administered activity if the PJ wanted to use the single household setup option, the PJ would end up with five separate activities, one activity for each of the five households. And if the PJ decided to use the batch setup option, there would be only one activity with all five households listed on the edit beneficiary screen. To set up this activity, I personally would select the batch option just because I prefer to set up one activity for multiple beneficiaries, but every PJ has its own preference. So we have already gone in and set up this activity. 
and now we want to fund it. So to do that, we have navigated to the edit activity screen and we scroll down and we select activity funding. And that will take us to the edit activity funding screen. And because we set up the sub fund and the sub grant, now the SU fund type appears in the activity funding sources and we can select that fund type. So that's the only real difference here. So to continue the activity funding process for a subrecipient administered activity, the PJ will come to this screen, select add edit to the right of the SU fund type, and then repeat the exact same steps that we walked through to fund the other activity earlier. So once the activity is funded, then the PJ can draw funds using the same process we walked through earlier. Before I move on to the drawing funds, I just want to go ahead and repeat um, what I said about locating the SU fund type one more time. So because we set up the sub fund and the sub grant, the SU fund type appears in the activity funding sources and we can select the SU fund type. That's the only difference here when you're funding a TBRA activity that is being administered by a subrecipient. Okay, so now that the activity is funded, we can draw funds. And like I said, we'll use that exact same process as we did earlier. So we're not gonna walk through that entire process. We just want you to know that the only difference in drawing funds for a subrecipient administered activity is when you create a voucher, you must, must, must make sure that you're selecting the correct organization. So if we're in a town and we want to draw funds for this subrecipient administered activity, we cannot select ourselves here. We have to select the subrecipient and the subrecipient will appear in this drop down menu here because we added the subrecipient as an organization earlier. So please remember if you're trying to draw funds for a subrecipient administered activity and you don't see that subrecipient listed here, that means you need to go back and add that organization like we showed you a few minutes ago. So this, I don't know if you can see the slides are, it's a very small change. So this is what the voucher should not look like. Any town should not select itself for the voucher creation. It should look like this. This is an example of what any town would select. So we'd create the voucher for housing people everywhere and then enter our activity ID below and follow the exact same steps we walked through earlier. So that is drawing funds for a TBRA activity that is administered by a subrecipient. The last thing that we are going to walk through in our demonstrations today is completing the TBRA activity in IDIS. So when do we complete our TBRA activity? Home ARP TBRA, T, excuse me, home ARP TBRA activities can be completed in IDIS when there are no more eligible costs to pay for our qualifying households. And the eligible funding amount is equal to the total funded amount. So if you try to complete the activity and those requirements are not met, IDIS will not allow you to complete the activity. Sometimes project delivery costs will be different in real life from what we've estimated they would be in IDIS when we set up the activity. So if that happens before completing the activity, you must make sure to update the project delivery cost field here. And as we know, when we update that cost, IDIS will automatically update the eligible funding amount for us here. So to complete the activity, You'll return to the edit activity screen and you will select check home. Selecting check home is going to tell you whether the activity has met all of its requirements to be completed in IDIS. If it's not, IDIS will tell you that the activity cannot be completed and why. So this is an example of what that would look like. This error message is telling us that we cannot complete this activity because our total funded amount does not equal our eligible funding amount and that our funds 
have not all been dispersed. So this is what it should look like in IDIS on the funding screen when the activity is ready for completion. So you can see right here the total funded amount and the eligible funding amount and the drawn amount are all $44,250. So this activity is ready for completion. And if that's the case, and we select check home, we receive this message here, and it tells us that the activity pathway is complete, which means we can move on to our next step. And that is to change the activity status here from open to completed. And when we do that and we save, the page will refresh and it will show the updated activity status as completed. So that concludes our demonstration of setting up funding, drawing funds for and completing home ARP TBRA activities in IDIS. For additional information about home ARP TBRA activities, please see the home ARP notice. Also, there was a new IDIS for TBRA activities fact sheet that was posted today on the home ARP page of the HUD.gov site. And um, we know these links in our PowerPoint, um, you can't click on them during the presentation, but we will make sure um, that everyone gets these links so that you can navigate to where you need to in our additional resources. If you have any other IDIS or home ARP related questions, um, always feel free to visit the Ask an IDIS question on the HUD Exchange, or um, please send us an email at homearp at hud.gov. Now, um, I believe we are going to have um, a little bit of time for Q&A. And um, while Courtney gets the Q&A questions together um, to read out, uh, I just wanted to repeat what Teresa said. The slide deck will be posted on the HUD.gov site along with a recording of this webinar and a transcript. So when the slide deck is posted, you will be able to click on the links. Thank you, Jessica. All right, so I'm gonna read out some of the questions that we've had coming in. So first of all, which activity setup option is the most common, the single household or the batch setup? I would say they're equally common. Um, it's half-half. People with a very large TBRA program don't want a million IDIS activities, so they are more likely to choose the batch setup option. Um, but administratively, it does seem a bit easier to do the single household setup. So if you have a smaller, more manageable TBRA program, a lot of EJs do seem to go with the single household setup because it's easy to tell when the written agreement execution date is. It's easy to tell when to complete your activity. Um, but when you go to draw funds, if you have a lot of separate IDIS activity IDs, it could get a little bit confusing um, drawing down money. And EJs can make a lot of mistakes that way. If you mistype a certain activity ID, maybe you accidentally draw funds for the wrong tenant um, in certain vouchers, things like that. Again, there's no preference at HUD for which option you choose, and it's pretty much a 50-50 split. Thank you. So we have another question that is related to that. Um, would it be appropriate to use the batch method when using a subrecipient to administer the TBRA program and use a subrecipient contract execution date versus the first tenant agreement date? That's a good question, and I can see why this is a confusing um, why this is a confusing topic for some people. But to answer the question, no, it would not be appropriate. Uh, you should not be using the subrecipient agreement date. The subrecipient written agreement corresponds to the SU subgrant. So it corresponds to the subgrant level. That's the subrecipient agreement, not the activity level. The activity level corresponds to a commitment to a specific local project, which only happens for TBRA once the rental assistance contract for a specific qualifying household has been executed. 
So the written agreement execution date for any TBRA activity has to match the date of a rental assistance contract with a household. That's the commitment date for an activity because that's the date of a commitment to a specific local project. So to recap, even if you chose the batch setup option and you're using a subrecipient, you should still use the date that the first rental assistance contract was executed as the written agreement execution date. Great. Okay, so we have another um, question and comment um, on a related topic. So we heard from one attendee that they have been using the um, subrecipient agreement as their WAED. Um, and I think you just responded to that point. And the second part of this individual's comment was, uh, for home activities, we've been told to enter the last date on contracts that have two party signatures. Should we be using the last date, the signature of the date of the last signature, or the date of the earliest signature? <laughs> That's a good question. And I think this is uh, conflating the date of a contract versus what the date of a contract should be. So if you have a lease and there are two signatures on it, the execution date of that lease is the date the last person signed it. So that is still accurate. But if you're doing the TBRA activity setup, and you have, let's say, 50 leases that go with it, then you would use the execution date of the lease that you executed first. Does that help to clarify things? Hopefully it does. Thank you. All right, so next, where does the project delivery cost come from and how is it calculated? So for tenant-based rental assistance, there is very specific eligible project delivery costs. You should refer to the home ARP notice for what those are. Um, you would be determining that yourself because uh, it's related to the inspection of the units and things like that. So you would determine how much it costs you to deliver your TBRA activity, and that is the amount that you would enter onto the activity setup screen as the project delivery. Okay, next, what happens if you don't set up a sub fund? If you do not set up a sub fund, as Teresa mentioned, you cannot set up a sub grant. So the sub fund must come first. Right, so it's, it's the system won't let you. So you can't even set up a sub grant incorrectly if you don't have a sub fund first. Okay. How do you handle a decrease in the rental assistance amount partially through the assistance period? If you update the monthly assistant, assistance amount, it throws off the total so there isn't enough funding for the period of assistance. That is a great question. Okay, so the way to address a subsidy decrease like that for a household is to average out what the monthly subsidy would be and enter that average amount as a monthly TBRA subsidy. So for example, let's say you have household X, you receive $1,000 a month in TBRA. At month seven of their 12 month lease, they move to another unit and they will only be receiving $500 a month in TBRA for the rest of their lease term. So instead of entering $1,000 or $500 as the monthly TBRA subsidy amount in IDIS, you should be entering the average between those two amounts. So enter $750 as the monthly subsidy for that household, and that will get you to the proper for the TBRA activity. Okay. If we have multiple subrecipients, can we add all of the amounts from the written agreements into one sub fund? You yes. <clears throat> um, I believe the question is, if you have, let's say, uh, three different subrecipients handling TBRA for you, can they all go under the same SU subfund? The answer is yes. There can only be one SU subfund for your home ERP grant. It's one SU subfund per year. You can make each subrecipient or nonprofit its own subgrant, and like let 
you'd make three different subgrants and they would all fit in under the single SUSE. How do we report on accomplishments if the batch project is multi-year? The first year you would have no completions? That's correct. You would not complete your activity until the last rental assistance payment went out. So your accomplishments would be once you completed the activity at whatever year um, it is. It, it happens to be when you've made the final payment. But if you're talking about your caper, you can absolutely discuss your TBRA accomplishments, your home ARP TBRA accomplishments in the caper, even if the activity itself is not completed yet. Okay, great. So our next question, um, this individual just wants to confirm that their understanding is correct. So um, for drawdowns, you're only supposed to draw down actual amounts of rent subsidy and or security deposits that have been paid out. Is that correct? That is correct. Like typically a lot of home grantees work on a reimbursement basis. Um, for TBRA, I know there is a bit of a gray area because you sometimes draw it in advance of the rent being due at the beginning of the month. Um, but you do not under any circumstances, draw the full 12 months of subsidy for a household right away. Um, you should be drawing it down as, as the months go by. So it should work closer to that reimbursement basis model that that person asked about that we discussed. Okay, our next question is back to about sub funds and sub grants. So uh, this person wrote, a subrecipient is doing outreach and intake for TBRA for our PJ, but we are dis dispersing the rent payments. Would we use EN funds for rent payments and SU payments for actual project, for actual delivery costs? I think at this point, you should be reaching out to your CPD rep at the field office. I think what I'm hearing is that you're, you are, you have a PJ administered TBRA program and that you're paying out the monthly subsidies yourself. Your sub recipient is really just doing um, some project delivery or something like that. But I think you should have a discussion with your CPD rep at the field office because just in the event that maybe the person doing the intake or you're doing the uh, part of the, what was it, Courtney, like the income verification or something like that? The outreach and the intake for the program. Yeah, so I guess my concern is if you have a subrecipient doing the outreach, they're outreaching to more people than, than come into the TBRA program. So I wouldn't necessarily call that SU if that makes sense. The project delivery is only project delivery, eligible as project delivery, if the tenant actually goes into the program. So I would discuss the specific details of your TBRA program, how it's set up with your rep, and then you determine what is project delivery and what is um, eligible TBRA costs. And then we can have a discussion about how it should be funded in IDIS. Okay. Next. Um, Someone commented, I noticed you clicked exempt for the environmental requirement for this TBRA activity. Is this standard that the environmental is exempt? So that, excuse me, that part of the demonstration, we, um, we select exempt for our demonstrations because it's the easiest thing to do to set up the activity in the system. So that does not mean that every TBRA activity um, is exempt yes, from it is. the environment. Yes, it does. Uh, yeah, actually it is. Um, and this is not an environmental review webinar, so any uh, questions about what the appropriate level of environmental review should be, should be directed to your CPD rep at the Office of Energy and Environment. Okay, great. So our next question is, is a clarification. If the subsidy amount 
changes for a tenant, we are supposed to change the amount of the subsidy in the beneficiary data to the average amount, correct? Was there, was there a second part to that question? There is no second part. So <laughs> that was a yes. Okay, sorry, your um, mic cut out slightly, so I wasn't sure if you're still talking. Oh, yeah. All right, next question. When you use a sub fund to do a drawdown, does the money go to the sub recipients of the PJ? It does not go to the sub recipient. It still goes to you. Um, your bank account is what is linked uh, between IDIS and LOCK. So any money you draw down still goes to you. You would still have to transfer that money to your subrecipient. Okay. Next. Does it matter if the first date of a lease predates the agreement with the subrecipient? This is a question you need to be having with your CPD rep at the field office as well. Um, because this is a policy question. Okay, great. What is the main difference between the regular home TBRA versus the home ARP TBRA in IDIS? And these, this is more of a programmatic um, question. So, be on the lookout for any home ARP TBRA webinars that go into the specifics of eligible costs and things like that. The primary difference we talked about today is that the beneficiaries for home ARP TBRA must be a qualifying population. But if you're talking about specifics on eligible costs and things like that, um, direct these questions to the home ARP at hud.gov email or direct them to your CPD rep. Okay, and then we are new to TBRA. Will we need to apply for it? Um, I'm guessing, I, I think this question is referring to a tenant who, a prospective tenant who wants home ARP TBRA from a PJ. Um, we don't have any more context in that particular question. I'm going to guess if it's a PJ, uh, let's say they're a PJ and they are interested in running a TBRA program. And Okay, so in running a TBRA program, then again, consult with your CPD rep and familiarize yourself with the rules. We're really veering into programmatic questions here. Um, and determine if it's the right fit for you before you decide to launch into a TBRA. Um, Courtney, does it look like most of the questions are programmatic and not system specific? Most of the rest of the questions. I think that is actually it for what we are going to um, discuss during the webinar today. And the rest of the questions that we've received, we will respond to in writing. Okay, great. And um, even for questions that we did receive um, or that we're getting now, like Courtney said, we will post them with the web recording of the webinar and the slide deck along with other webinar materials. So you can look for those shortly. Um, they'll be posted on the home ARP webpage on HUD.gov. I think, um, it took us maybe two or three weeks to post the materials for the supportive services webinar, so you can estimate the same time frame for this. Um, I think, and with that, I think I want to thank everybody for tuning in, and thank you so much, Teresa, for such a great job with all those demos, and Courtney for organizing the questions and reading them out, and Danielle, and yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, Marilyn, I think we'll turn things back over to you. All right, thank you everyone for joining us today. That concludes our conference and you may now disconnect.